Greetings shippers, welcome back, and it's time to take a look at a fandom that had a lot going on in its heyday and still does to this day, more than people expect at least. And this includes the fact that people still ask a lot of questions, particularly about how it has concluded at the time of this recording. It's time for yet another Sherlock postmortem to see if we can shed anything new on what has already been discussed, well, it's been discussed a lot. There have been some new comments made about the contentious series 4. It must be noted that everything we're going to discuss is going to be an overview, because if you were part of the Sherlock fandom, or even if you were just observing it a little bit, you will know that a lot happened. A lot. So many things. There was even Justin Bieber drama. So much went on. So we're going to touch on everything a little casually. This is being reiterated, especially when it comes to the John Locke conspiracy, because as anybody who knows about that will know, it would take a lot to explain all of that. And it's not the only factor in what people feel was wrong with Series 4 either. There have been narratives floating around for years about who exactly is to blame for Series 4, with disgruntled fans placing the blame firmly on the creators, but there is also been another narrative, one that has even been sensationalized at times. And that is the idea that fans and fandom ruined Series 4, and Sherlock in general. So we're going to examine this idea and see if it holds any merit, and just go on a journey back into the Sherlock fandom, and perhaps revisit some things that we may have forgotten. Before we get started, if you haven't already, please do follow on social media to stay up to date, know when we're streaming, and just come on over to chit chat about fandom. It's a good time, I swear. Now we have a mystery to get to. The game is afoot. I just, I can't, I can't with the game is on. Sherlock was a mega hit BBC series that aired between the years of 2010 and 2017, consisting of four series or seasons made up of 12 episodes and one special, and one mini episode that aired before the start of the third series. One may note that there is quite a gap of years for so few episodes. The series was plagued by gaps between seasons that only expanded as the years went on, largely due to the increase in popularity and acclaim of the two titular leads, Benedict Cumberbatch and Martin Freeman, who played Holmes and Watson respectively. This meant that they took on other projects that would at times supersede commitments to Sherlock. This meant that the fandom landscape in general was quite different by the time the series ended compared to when it started. It also meant that fans had long periods to discuss, ponder, ship, create, and plan in between series, which added a layer of dedication and possessiveness to an already loyal fan base. The first series of Sherlock airing in 2010 was a huge success, coming a year after the Guy Ritchie Robert Downey Jr. outing released in 2009. Many fans felt that this new BBC adaptation was a truer adaptation, and they also felt that the modernization aspect was flawlessly implemented and gave it a nice twist. They loved the Holmes Watson dynamic, and a strong ship was born pretty much instantly. This, despite the fact that it was disavowed canonically by the first episode, though the way in which it was done did leave a lot of room for shippers to maneuver in, and created an aura of thou doth protest too much. It would also later give rise to conspiracy theories, and also discourse that the show was very much mishandling the idea of LGBTQ plus rights, and just how to talk about those type of topics in general. So while the point may have been made, it is a point that raises contention in its handling to this day. Fans also enjoy the different take on Moriarty, the increased presence and familial dynamic granted to Mycroft, and on the whole it just went over well. There were some critiques, and they would grow in scale and volume, but for the time, all seemed well. The fandom was also situated during the boom period of Tumblr, the halcyon days, at least their tail end, that modern users often cast their eyes back to with much nostalgia. While not perfect, it was certainly a different experience than Tumblr at the time of this recording, and the fandom was able to explode, sharing theories, gifts, art, fix, and more. Particularly when it came to discourse, there was a lot of that surrounding this series. Talks about feminism, the usage of characters of color, and more. It was also here, however, that some of the more toxic seeds began to be sown, though depending upon what part of the fandom one was in, this could change. Series 2 aired in 2012, and for the most part maintained tone and focus, introducing a beloved version of Irene Adler, and taking place at what is colloquially known as the last year of Tumblr's peak. At this point, discourse began to feature more and more heavily on Tumblr, which was not a problem in and of itself. It was how it was employed and how vitriolic the discussions could get that began to be an issue. At this point, people began to examine the series as a whole, and the discussions around what was happening began to evolve. Camps began to form over the acceptable ships, who was a well-written character and who was not, and discussions didn't just stay between fans. Sherlock is a fandom where one can note numerous interactions between actors and fans, as well as creators and fans. It is also a series that attempted to acknowledge fan culture, specifically fangirl culture, which is not made up of only girls, with a tone that started off as gently mocking, even if some read the first attempts as mean-spirited, and then descended into outright mockery, at least of its shipping contingent, and also of its theorists, some of whom in all fans 
awareness had grown to become quite toxic. Though some feel as as creators are in a position of authority, it is not right for them to turn around and mock fandom in such a way. On the flip side, there was also a very positive side of the fandom taking firm root, taking part in charity initiatives and the like. It was a highly multifaceted place, which could also be seen in terms of fandom overlap, which would also come to play a part in Sherlock's story. For Sherlock found itself a part of many crossovers, particularly the much remembered Super Hulock, which we have done a video on. If you missed it, you know the drill. Click the card or the link will be down below. Some believe that Super Hulock simply referred to a fan of all three series, which at times it could, but it ultimately truly referred to fans who were engaged in a large crossover universe between the three series. So what was part of what led to this? Sherlock was created by Mark Gatiss and Stephen Moffat. The latter of the two was significantly involved in Doctor Who. Of specific note was him taking over as head writer and executive producer from Russell T Davies in 2008, with him working in a production capacity on the show from 2009 to 2017. Moffat garnered quite a negative reputation with fans of both series, notably for being insulting to any fans with criticisms, whatever they may be, from shipping to just overall tone and pacing. He would also be snide with fans at cons. With Moffat, there was another interesting dynamic in that he himself had been an active member of fan culture, with people being able to track back his multiple posts about Doctor Who, which led to many feeling that he should have a better understanding of fandom, or perhaps that now that he was in a creative role, he was looking down at his past fandom roots. In 2012, at the BAFTA Awards, he stated, there's been a weird backlash among, I presume, fairly stupid people about the fact the shows are complicated and clever, but they're both huge international hits. We make no apology. Don't expect to do the ironing, sit down and pay attention and think about it. Audiences like complexity. They follow intricately plotted soap operas all the time. It depresses me when people say it's all far too clever. This was stemming from the fact that there were lots of critiques of Moffat's writing, specifically the idea that it could be at times overly complicated for no reason. Moffat himself had already been documented as having a negative opinion of fans and their, well, fanaticism as early as 2011, and some minor incidents before that. In 2011, there was an incident in involving a script leak of plot details for upcoming Doctor Who. The bad feelings grew when fans maligned what was leaked as poorly written and overly reliant on plot twists. Some felt that the attitude he had towards certain segments of his fan base carried over on both sides into the Sherlock fandom. Particularly as Sherlock had such a vocal shipping contingent who would come into conflict with writers time and time again, accusing them of queer baiting or hiding secret relationship clues. Theories that were in many ways given room to grow to sizes they would not have in other series because of the gaps in time. In terms of queer baiting, there are arguments to be made for and against the series doing it. As much as for certain fans, it is an open and shut case. It still remains a point of contention in fandom. There are debates as to whether it is fans reading far too much into things, ignoring the creator's authorial intent, or the creative staff mishandling the relationship, or all of the above. When in doubt, Pixie. Following series two, there would be yet another two year gap before series three was released in 2014. Despite the season having been commissioned at the same time as two, and certain sequences for the series three opener even filmed at that time. This season would feature the addition of Mary Morstan, John's wife, and things kicked off before anything was ever shown. There was quite the backlash against the actress and at the time wife of Martin Freeman, Amanda Abington. This one coming mostly from the shipping contingent who did not put their best foot forward in the situation. It was an incident used to paint all of the fandom with the same brush as obsessive and cruel. And while not accurate, the backlash against the actress was truly something sad to behold. For many in the fandom, they felt this incident signified to the public what they had feared had been happening in certain quarters for years, a progressive increase in toxicity. Aside from the threats and hate comments for the disruption to potential canonical John Locke, series three veered in terms of focus. While mysteries and cases were still there, now there was a bit more of an emphasis on Sherlock and his psychology. And not all fans were here for that. Not only the shift in tone, but the discourse surrounding the series had also changed in this regard. There were many more blogs and fans talking about how Sherlock was not a good person, and they felt that the series was fetishizing him, fetishizing mental illness, and fetishizing being a jerk. People were beginning to complain that the relationship between John and Sherlock was abusive, that the treatment of Molly Hooper was appalling, that Moffat didn't know how to write women or characters, and that the series was beginning to become self-indulgent. These ideas had long been floating around in the fandom, but they were now beginning to gain real traction and be shared more and more often, even outside of fanish locales. It did not help that the series also opened with an episode that mocked Sherry Artie Shippers 
and shipping culture in general, which some felt was in good fun, but others could not take as such due to all the other factors surrounding the creative crew involved. At this point, pre-existing tensions between fans and creators were not only on the rise, but were becoming more evident to people entering the fandom. Again, depending upon where one was, it was possible to have a completely positive experience, particularly if one stayed off of Tumblr. Though in terms of this fandom, it did leak out and spread to other places, including of course Reddit and Twitter, and even a little bit onto AO3. Now, some took to the shift in the series, while others felt it was losing focus. And while most fans came to accept Amanda Abington as Mary Morstan, there was confusion as to how her character was handled on the series. There were also critiques and questions as to the decision to remove Moriarty so early, as at the time, it appeared that many more series could be incoming. Already a hot topic, actors and crew began to be questioned more and more about the direction of the series and its future. Questions that they became more and more reticent to answer, particularly as they were involved in other projects. And these questions could bleed into interviews about aforementioned other projects, which is not always something an actor or creator wants to talk about when they're trying to promote another work. These questions would be left to simmer and wait for three years, as the special that aired in 2016 was for the most part a period piece, with only small segments connecting it back to the rest of the series. However, this was enough to reignite fandom excitement. It was in this overall gap in general that the more positive side of the Sherlock fandom truly shone, keeping interest alive in the way only the finest transformative fans can. There were podcasts, there were cons, there were dedicated Twitter accounts posting updates and pictures every day. There were fix, and there was a yearning for the series to return. Theorists also thrived during this period as well, and Series 3 had even managed to give rise to a healthy OT3 that had negated some of the Mary Morrison negativity, alongside a fondness for Abington's performance. Beneath all this, there was the simmering discourse discussions. Some productive, others not. However, without new material to add to it, these discussions could only go so far. If Season 3 had given rise to fans' doubts about the series' overall direction, Series 4 shattered them, and ended up polarizing certain segments of the fandom. However, the predominant feeling seemed to be that this series was disappointing, lackluster, was overly complicated, and had lost the plot. While for those who had accepted the series' new direction, some felt that it was a triumph, and even answered questions that they had long been wondering about, and gave fans exactly what they asked for. For those who disliked the season, as different as they may have been in other parts of fandom, they could come together to say that they did not enjoy Series 4 for a wide array of reasons, from a lack of canonical John Locke, to the treatment of Molly Hooper, to the bizarre death of Mary Morstan, to the much-mocked secret sibling reveal, to the attempts to shoehorn in a deceased Moriarty, and more. Many fans left Series 4 with a question, but why though? Now the outcry was loud and unavoidable, and the more toxic side of the fandom exploded. While some had been holding out for Series 4 to be an improvement and create hype for a Series 5, that died out quickly, and now it is questionable whether a Series 5 will ever occur, particularly with how busy both leads are, not to mention what they have said about it, which can mostly be summed up as maybe, but most likely not. So with all of that groundwork laid, and believe it or not, that is still a bare bones version. What have the creative staff said about Series 4? For what fans have said is there for the world to see, surmised as disappointment and a squandering of potential. Also, the writing has been critiqued as overly reliant on plot twists, a rearing up of the same critique leveled at Moffat years earlier. In 2017, Gatiss, showrunner, co-writer, and the actor portraying Mycroft snapped back at fans who felt that Series 4 had been confusing. He stated, people ask if it's good to challenge the audience. Of course it f***ing is. Why would you not want to challenge your audience? I did a phone-in after the Christmas special a few years ago, and someone said Sherlock was too complicated for people to follow. I said, oh, go and pour some warm paste into your mouth. Go and read a children's book with hard pages if you don't want to be challenged. We're making the show we want to make. We don't make it a certain way because fans are pressuring us. So Gaitis' statement implies that they were trying to hold on to their own vision and not be bullied or swayed by fan expectations, which were quite vocal and coming from all corners. He wasn't the only only one to comment on fans impacting the series. Martin Freeman had this to say in an interview printed in May of 2018, when asked about Sherlock and the series' global fan base and the potential of a Series 5. People's expectations. Some of it's not fun anymore. It's not a thing to be enjoyed. It's a thing of, you better f***ing do this, otherwise you're a c that's not fun anymore. This prompted a rather flippant response from Sherlock actor himself, Bandit Cumberbatch, who told Radio Time the following, It's the responsibility of the storytellers to manage that, really. And I think, you know, it's pretty weak to blame that on fans. You're either along for the ride or not. Freeman would then respond walking his comments back and expressing frustration at media culture, as he felt that they had mischaracterized the situation. As the headlines had essentially read, Martin Freeman blames fans for no Series 5. What the headlines said, 
I didn't say. I didn't say that Sherlock isn't fun for me anymore. I never said that. I was talking about different aspects of expectations of some fans. What I resented was it made it sound like I was saying doing Sherlock isn't fun. There's a lot of people I love on that show, and that show has been extremely good to all of us. So yeah, I hate the pr I hate everything. It's rife with danger. This whole thing about it, when you open your mouth about anything, something is going to be taken the wrong way, and context is everything. You have to try and stay away from that stuff. In interviews, you say things, but you wouldn't print them on a t-shirt. We're all living with that fear of being misunderstood. He went on to state that he was grateful for Sherlock and its fans. His statements paint a picture of a production actively intimidated by portions of its own vociferous fan base. It also lent credence to rumors that have been circulating for years that him and co-star Cumberbatch were not close or overly friendly, which for some shattered the illusion and made a desire for a fifth series shrink, as actor chemistry can be part of maintaining enthusiasm for a property, something the MCU uses to great effect. Now let us take a look at the most recent statements made by a cast member in the year of 2019, comments from Amanda Abington, in an interview with The Times. I don't think they were very happy with the last series. I think it got very complicated. I love Stephen Moffat, but I think they started to pander to the fans, involving a lot of fandom stuff, I thought. You should just stick to the stories, because they're much more interesting. She later quickly posted a follow-up tweet to stave off any potential misunderstandings or backlash, which she had already experienced from the fandom, which stated, Hashtag Stephen Moffat is a fabulous writer. I loved being a part of Series 4 of Sherlock, and thought it was pretty spot on. I just needed to say that in case anyone got the wrong end of the stick. It was a joy and a pleasure to be part of, and I'm incredibly proud of it. Aside Aside from this comment indicating a clear fear of fan backlash, it also highlighted some interesting points. There were more comments, but these three, or four rather, rang the loudest, and also together begin to create a semi-clear picture. One thing which is highlighted that cannot be overstated, and is at times forgotten by fans, is that everyone here had a different perception and different levels of control, with much less given to the actors than was at times credited to them. What is happening on a series can look very different from person to person, and also changes over time, which is how Gatiss can believe they shook off fan expectations, while Abington can believe they pandered to them. Side note, fans were confused as to how exactly Series 4 was meant to have pandered to them, if that was indeed the case. However, other fans have noted that they believe that the shift away from mysteries and the focus on Sherlock's relationship with other characters, particularly John and Mycroft, was meant to be more for the fans, as was the domestic familial ending for John and Sherlock, as well as the confession of love to Molly Hooper. Another thing all of this showcases is that fans and fandom did 100% have an impact on the show and its trajectory. They were a factor, and they were addressed and acknowledged within certain episodes, so some believe it stands to reason that they could have had an impact on the overall path of the show, as their presence and zeal was noted, and in cases not appreciated, or even feared by certain people working on the production. It is also clear that these feelings simmered, and would at times boil over, and sometimes be directed at the fans who deserved it the least. Some of this also stemmed from the time period when all this was occurring, the early 2010s, a time of infamy when it came to fan creation interactions, as numerous blunders were made, as creators learned to navigate and interact with their now more accessible and bolder than ever audience, just as they were learning to navigate their newfound boundaries, something some feel that they have never fully grasped. For some, Sherlock is a perfect example of how fan entitlement can ruin a show. For others, it shows what happens when too much time elapses and those involved lose a grasp on what their core concept was, or subconsciously begin trying to create something that is the antithesis of what members of their fandom want. For others, this is a case of the poor example examples of fan culture coming together with a creative crew who is not the best at managing their positions of authority, creating a clash that was doomed to explode at some point. Depending upon how one feels about fandom, that tends to determine where blame is laid. Some feel fans need to leave creators alone, and accept the story they are trying to tell. This was levied particularly against shippers in this fandom. Also at theorists, there was a lot of backlash against Sherlock theorists post-series 4. Indeed, it started a cascade of a discussion about how theories should be presented in general, and there has been been a shift, more modern theories tend to be presented a bit more carefully and with a bit less certainty, although there are of course exceptions. Others feel that while it is a creator's story, they still need to treat their fandoms with respect, and find ways to diffuse or ignore the more toxic portions rather than engage with or mock them, as such activities only lead to more backlash and more resentment on both sides. However, the question from some then becomes, what is a creator to do, as it is not acceptable that they should just sit there and take abuse. One solution offered is for creators to stay out of more fan 
unfinished spaces, to which some counter with the rise of social media and tagging, that is no longer possible, and that it is important for creators to be connected to their fan base so as not to lose touch. It is still an ongoing discussion. Sherlock perhaps attained a level of popularity that none anticipated, and the amount of voices, critiques, and enthusiasm that brought may have been more than the crew was prepared for, especially as it appears that in certain sectors, egos were involved. Simultaneously, the fandom may have overestimated its reach and unity, for it was more fractured than it oft times presented itself. Cracks that are easier to see in retrospect, but hindsight is 2020. So as for the question swirling in fandom, was the lackluster Series 4 the fan's fault? And the answer is most likely partially, but not entirely. There were many other factors, one being the creators as well. However, there is more. If anything, Season 4 is a culmination of a series evolution in both fandom and non-fandom spheres, running parallel and clashing. The two fed off of each other in the symbiotic relationship between creator and fan that if not properly curated on both sides can easily become warped. Some think the success of Series 1 and 2 could simply not be recreated, that they belong to their time, and even if things had come back the same, it wouldn't have been the same, as the fans and the fandom landscape were different. A lot can change in seven years. Some feel that passion for the project waned, and other opportunities arose, and that there simply wasn't a push to create Sherlock anymore. It must also be noted that it can be disconcerting to be the focus of such ardent fan activity, so perhaps everyone was simply ready to move on. It's a question people will ponder for some time, though of course there are some who will proclaim that they have the answer. Of course, it must not be forgotten that there was a small contingent of fans who enjoyed Series 4, a subset of fans who tend to live quietly, attempting not to go against the fandom grain. Different strokes for different folks. If you were a fan who enjoyed Series 4 in its entirety, or just parts of it, share your experiences and what you enjoyed down below. All opinions welcome here. Sherlock was a fandom that opened itself up, and as a result, many fans had some great moments and experiences. And at the same time, there were corners where things simply got out of hand. A lot happened. As mentioned, this was an overview, and a pondering of a question that many still ask. So, what was your experience with the Sherlock fandom? It must be reiterated that there was a lot of positivity there, despite how it may seem. It could be a fun place, and it could also be a hot mess. Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. No, it wasn't perfectly balanced. <laughs> Let me know if you want to hear about any other stuff regarding this fandom, or if you like videos like this. Share all of your thoughts down below. There is, as always, lots to ponder, so feel free to leave a good old essay comment, because as you know, I love them. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to spend it discussing fandom with me. I always appreciate it. There are, as always, more videos coming soon, so if you haven't already, please do subscribe and hit that bell notification so that you never miss a vid. And if you enjoyed, please leave a like to help us out with the YouTube algorithm. I will see you all when I can, and until then, Let's get the outro. Bye bye. This has been Shipper's Guide to the Galaxy. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Special thanks to all of my patrons, names on the side, for helping to make these videos possible. There are, as always, more videos coming soon. So until then, stay tuned, for there are as many ships out there as there are stars in the sky.